Good morning, everybody. Um, there are lots of open seats at the table, so if you want to come around the table, I really uh, heartily recommend it, and that way you have access to a mic in case you want to ask questions. So um, we're going to get started, and um, we have uh, an excellent panel uh, this morning. So the session is, as you can see, um, open forum, and so it's an open forum, so I really um, encourage you to be um, to ask questions. The whole purpose of this is really to engage in a dialogue. Um, and um, what we're going to be uh, really focused on here is um, having a dialogue around human rights and the activities that are occurring in different spaces, and in particular those related to cyber norms in the open-ended working group and the group of governmental experts on cybersecurity. And we have um, an excellent panel, and I'll just introduce them, and then we're going to jump straight into their opening comments. Um, we won't be going, we won't have too many opening comments, so hopefully we can get straight into a, an open discussion on this subject. So uh, let me introduce the speakers. So we have Ambassador Heli Tirma Kla from the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and is also one of the representatives, governmental representatives on the UNGGE. We have Ms. Carmen Gonzalez, who is head of international cyber policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands and also on the UNGGE. We have Ms. Mallory Nodal, head of digital for Article 19, and Gonzalo Carrico from AT&T, associate director for EU affairs, and I'm Matthew Shears, member of the ICANN board. So I'm going to turn it over to Heli immediately so we can get started, and, um, and uh, please write, write down your questions. Um, if there's anybody in the uh, Zoom chat, if they can put their questions into the Zoom chat, that would be very helpful because I'll be managing that as well. So Heli, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you for um, everyone in the room because uh, I think uh, the human rights uh, um, on, in internet, uh, human rights in the domain of cyberspace is an increasingly important topic where um, not only us, the governments in, of uh, European Union, but also uh, uh, civil society, academia, and um, uh, private sector is uh, paying attention. Um, as Matthew was introducing to Canal, uh, we have several work streams in our, how we call it, cyber diplomats um, processes right now where we see an um, increasing challenge to make sure that the human rights agenda will stay high on um, general um, uh, UN cyber debate agenda. Uh, we have been um, part of the open-ended working group, uh, which uh, already took place in September. And uh, I think um, uh, the first committee of the United Nations uh, is usually, of course, discussing the questions of uh, state behavior, of disarmament, um, of international security, peace and security. But uh, it was still overwhelming majority uh, of democratic governments who mentioned uh, the human rights issue during the open-ended working group in September. Um, when it comes to open-ended working group uh, broader outreach, then um, uh, we are quite glad to see uh, roughly 200 NGOs and um, civil society actors coming to New York next week, where the open-ended working group will have the informal consultations with the global civil society. Um, and, and we hope that these informal consultations with global civil society will serve also uh, the role of um, raising awareness on, on the issues of human rights, um, freedom online, and um, privacy and data protection, which are important um, also uh, in parallel with the questions of cybersecurity, state behavior, and all the hard security issues. Um, as Carmen and I, we are both sitting in GGE, which is the group of governmental experts, uh, then uh, maybe the audience might uh, be wondering um, how and, who and, and whether at all the GGE, which is this hard or the small group of, of countries which have most of cyber ex expertise or cyber capabilities, and how the GGE is um, taking the issue of human rights uh, forward. 
Um, all the consecutive GG reports which have been agreed mention um, the adherence to human rights and then we hope to also continue um, in, in the next GG in, uh, in order to make, make sure that um, this issue is not forgotten. But of course, um, uh, when we look at the um, normative uh, discussions in the UN right now, the first committee is still meant to discuss the state behavior and international peace and security as its primary goal. Um, but there is another committee, which maybe is more suitable, many other committees of course, but um, um, the, the second committee dealing with the social and economic affairs and, uh, and the third committee uh, uh, is also uh, uh, the committee where we should be uh, looking for the issue of um, human rights. And just to raise awareness maybe um, of those countries in the room that ha um, can influence the, their own governments in the issues of, of cyber discussions in the third committee, um, we had um, a resolution in the third committee this fall in uh, United Na Nations General Assembly which is calling for the new uh, United Nations cybercrime instrument. And uh, the European Union governments, the US and some other countries uh, are quite concerned that this new cybercrime instrument that the third committee resolution is now uh, supporting because it was passed, um, will um, have a detrimental effect to the human rights because uh, one of the uh, cybercrime conventions where um, we are all um, uh, having uh, the human rights safeguards is the Budapest Convention, the Council of Europe Convention. And, and uh, we have been supporting the um, promotion of the Council of Europe uh, Convention on Cybercrime now for a decade in, in, in the European Union and uh, amongst the democratic countries. So um, uh, we think still that the Budapest Convention provides all the necessary um, uh, uh, elements for uh, global uh, community and all the countries in the world to uh, be used as a blueprint uh, for domestic legislation on cybercrime. And very importantly, it has all the safeguards on human rights. And therefore, we would support that the Budapest Convention will be the primary uh, document or primary um, in instrument to be taken as a model uh, in order to um, deal with cybercrime. And, and we are a bit uh, cautious of supporting any new instruments exactly because we think that um, human rights safeguards um, you know, will be difficult to in be introduced into those new instruments, either in the first committee or in the third committee. Um, maybe my presentation was a bit UN and government centric but uh, I think we also have to raise awareness about the fact that uh, there is a small group of the Western government's diplomats in the UN setting that are pushing this agenda. And uh, it would be good if we also would have uh, support from the larger civil society and multi-stakeholder community uh, because then uh, the voice would be reaching uh, into the wider audiences. And, um, and, and we will continue our work but uh, our work uh, is still confined very much within this government-to-government -government business. And uh, maybe this panel could also serve the purpose of uh, providing the ideas how we could um, uh, amplify our message in the broader uh, community, also outside of our technologically advanced countries. So this is the homework for the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heli. Uh, Carmen, over to you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Heli, for uh, kicking off our discussions today with a very clear overview of, of what's going on, and I completely share your observations. What I can add from my side, the Dutch side, is that um, the issue of um, human rights online is very close to our heart. Um, and uh, not only that, we also remain quite uh, concerned about uh, developments um, uh, related to that issue um, uh, over the last couple of years. Because even though uh, the um, assertion that human rights online 
are equal to human rights offline has already been um, uh, made in, uh, in UN framework in 2012. Um, the situation globally hasn't really improved uh, as far as abidance by, um, um, by human rights online is concerned. I think we all agree and, and, and the reports of Freedom House are um, clear evidence uh, also in that regard that um, uh, apart from internet shutdowns, uh, increased censorship, um, but also um, surveillance practices that are not in line with uh, diplomatic principles, uh, we're not really um, going in the right direction at this moment. So attention and, and clear and, and, and awareness raising about the, the risks that are at, um, uh, are at stake here is very important because we are convinced indeed that uh, human rights protection and cybersecurity are not uh, at odds with each other. They are two sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand with each other. Um, a, a safe and secure society can only be a society built on a respect for human rights. And as our public life more and more moves to the digital world, um, it, it becomes more and more important that we assert and, and um, uh, implement those principles there, and that we also try to um, find ways to increase accountability, because it's uh, one thing to have um, um, recognition in the UN and also in UN um, resolutions, um, uh, like the um, resolution on the promotion, protection and enjoyment of human rights on the internet, but also the um, resolution, for example, annual resolution on privacy in a digital age. Although we have these resolutions, um, um, having th that on paper is not enough. They should not become paper tigers. We should try to um, uh, somehow uh, collectively uh, hold uh, those who do not um, uh, respect them accountable by means of um, uh, well statements uh, statements in general about about issues that are not um, condoned not to be condoned and I think in that regard the FOC uh, established in uh, 2011 uh, and doubled in size uh, since uh, Estonia is also a very important member uh, of the FOC but the FOC has uh, count 31 um, uh, member states now. Switzerland, and I'm incredibly happy with that, uh, is, is the latest uh, um, addition to the, the Freedom Online um, coalition community. This community, um, a governmental initiative, uh, start, is, 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 is um, uh, endeavoring together with civil society to uh, issue statements on uh, important uh, problems that have to be tackled. Um, there has been this. In, there have been important statements issued uh, on internet shutdowns, on censorship. Uh, there's and there is an important new um, um, statement in the making on uh, the importance of a, a human rights-based cyber, secu cyber security policy and practice. So, an, an, uh, a plea, a clear plea for um, cyber security policies and practices that are human rights uh, by design. So that's, um, uh, and why is that important that um, alongside well, the discussions in the UN, we have other initiatives uh, supporting those um, global UN discussions. It's because indeed the UN is, a, is an important platform, but it's also a platform where things move very slowly. And of course there are also clear differences of opinion within the UN, um, uh, not the least about um, issues that are very closely related to human rights online, issues in relation to the role of the state in the internet. Um, so the FOC can, I think, uh, with its statements that can have normative value, that can help as a, as a um, that can help us as, 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 as uh, triggers for discussions in the UN, um, continues to do that work and, and influences discussions. In the UN itself, indeed, discussions on human rights online will differ as far as 
the particular uh, um, UN discussion is concerned. In the first committee, there are some limitations because they're very much focused on international security, but we can always, uh, it's, it is important that we, every time we sit on the, on, around the table in the UN and talk about cybersecurity and international peace and security, we reassert that human rights um, are just as all the other bodies of international law, um, the basis for um, uh, the regulation of behavior in cyberspace. So human rights law has to be reasserted there once again, also in this round of the, of the GGE, as well as, and that's very important, in the open-ended working group. And I hope it, it will figure prominently in the consultations with civil society next week uh, in New York. Um, I think I'll just stop uh, here, because otherwise it'll take too much of your time. Thank you, Carmen. I think um, we'll, we'll come back. I'll come back to the two of you after um, the other speakers because I think it's important to put the, the OEWG and the GGE in, a, in context and perhaps just briefly, if you can briefly think about briefly outlining the, the differences of, between the two and what the, the timelines are. And I think that would be useful for some of those who are not familiar with those two processes. If we can turn to, to uh, Mallory. Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks for the grounding in um, the current stakes and, and also the, the framing about why human rights is important. So I just wanted to, from my perspective as civil society, talk about what we think are really important here and also how, how we engage, how we, how we get to, to have our voices heard. So I'm, um, I work for Article 19. It's a freedom of expression organization that has a global presence. Um, I mean, I work is out of the London office, and my team engages in um, technical standards for it, in fact. Um, but you can imagine that there's a lot of issues related to cybersecurity that come up in all those fora, and having the technical expertise um, can be really useful in these settings. Um, so, of course, we feel it's important that civil society be part of the conversation around um, norms and trust in cyberspace, uh, because as Carmen was mentioning, privacy and, and security are really, um, they're not at odds, and they're, they're especially not at odds if you if you shift the frame to center people. So if people are the primary uh, concern um, as recipients of a secure cyberspace, then you can imagine that that sort of dichotomy goes away and really it is privacy and security together hand in hand. Um, and so multi-stakeholder participation um, in cybersecurity processes is really critical so that um, the concerns of people that are now centered in these processes um, can be represented. Um, and also I would say in addition to the what we all know very well at the IGF of course about what multi-stakeholderism is in, in terms of bringing the right sectors into the room, I, th I also think it's important to ensure the right competencies are, are in the room too and that there's a diversity of them um, and so it's not only um, policy folks, lawyers, you also include technical experts and so on, especially when we're talking about the internet that can have a profound impact on the, um, the outcomes of debates and discussions. Um, I would just say that things that we still need to solve with respect to multi-stakeholder participation, um, one of them is, is clearly capacity, which um, I mentioned when I was talking about co competencies, but the other is that spaces are really proliferating. These conversations are happening um, in every corner of the world um, in, in many different ways um, in fora that we're not previously talking about the internet at all. Um, they're now discussing cyber, cyber security um, and implications of cyberspace. So it's very intense for, um, for civil society to have to keep up with and that is why you often see civil society uh, coordinating amongst itself to ensure that we're covering all of the different fora and the spaces where these conversations are happening. But I would also indicate too, uh, which, is, which is also something that's been said before, is that um, there's also a need for countries with less capacity to also be involved. Countries from the global south um, who don't have as um, much time or ability to travel to all these spaces, and small businesses. We, we do have a lot of participation from the private sector, but we have participation from large internet companies. Um, and you imagine that small and medium-sized businesses as well have a particular 
um, stake in how the internet is governed. And so we need to think about um, not just that stakeholders are represented, but that the stakeholders themselves are diverse in their representation and multi-stakeholder discussions around trust and norms in cybersecurity. And I think that this is important for two reasons. One, of course, is to obviously just engage um, in, in um, norm setting to establish the role of the state in cybersecurity, as Carmen said, but also the responsibility of the state in cybersecurity. And then the second reason is to generate buy-in, because once those norms are established, once those policies are set, you have to implement them. And you can't implement them without many stakeholders working together. And so when you include these voices in the room and these stakeholders in the room, you have then the people um, and the energy and the capacity to who can then go out and help you um, make them a reality uh, for, for citizens all around the world. So that would be where I would start and things that I'm interested in from a civil society perspective. Mallory, um, Carmen mentioned the Freedom Online Coalition. Do you just want to take a minute and, and explain um, your engagement in the Freedom Online Coalition and, and, and how the civil society works in that particular construct? Thanks. Exactly. Well, and I think a lot of what I talked about came from my work with the Freedom Online Coalition um, that began some years ago as a working group that was established um, by the members of the Freedom Online Coalition, but also included um, private sector and civil society. And we were tasked with well, the, the task force was called an internet free and secure, and we wanted to discuss how, or investigate and research how human rights um, would play into discussions around cybersecurity. And the two main, well, we have a definition that was people-centric, that's one, but then the two other main outputs of that work was being able to center people in um, cybersecurity and sort of eradicate this push and pull between privacy and security, which was really important in the years 2014 through 2017, I would say. Um, and then, well, remains so today, actually. Um, and then we had several recommendations that it was one of the first norms documents in 2016 that were launched around um, people-centric uh, and human rights respecting cybersecurity policy making. Thanks, Mallory. Over to you, Gonzalo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for uh, inviting me. I will, I will perhaps bring a perspective, a cybersecurity perspective from a corporate uh, point of view. And um, we think that uh, diplomacy and global dialogues are perhaps more urgently today than ever before. Um, we live in time when we are all hyper-connected and actions that take place in uh, one corner of the globe, maybe positive or negative, they will have, uh, they can rever reverberate everywhere. So um, the global diffusion of internet technology, computing power, and digitization are trends that are here to stay. So the question is uh, how we all come together to make sure we capitalize on the potential of global connectivity and technological progress, uh, while remain clear uh, about the challenge uh, and risks we have ahead. Um, I think that we must work together across uh, industry and national borders, because success in the internet age must reflect the smart balance of interest of consumers, business, and national governments. And to achieve this, global leaders must remain steadfast on their commitments to build um, greater consensus, transparency, and open dialogue across borders. Uh, we must also recognize that um, security requirements uh, requires a similar holistic approach uh, that includes people, process, and things and that we all have a responsibility uh, and a role to play. So policies designed to facilitate collaboration on cybersecurity and harmonize international standards can streamline international trade in cybersecurity industry, foster continued growth and innovation, and disseminate technical expertise, and best practice that improve security across the, the, um, the digital ecosystem. Uh, we think that international standards are a foundational component that can protect innovation and build a safer and more secure digital ecosystem. For example, ongoing efforts on the 3GPP to, de to develop secure, interoperable technical standards for the next generation networks are essentially necessary if we are to unlock the full potential of 5G technologies and preserve today's vibrant and competitive markets. 
Um, for AT&T, cybersecurity is a business imperative. It's our responsibility to protect our customers and their data. So AT&T operates critical communication infrastructure and provides security service to governments and business customers. We also maintain a strong cybersecurity practice for our for all affiliates and services. Just as states are now organizing through the United Nations GG mechanism, the private sector has been engaged in long-standing efforts to secure the digital ecosystem. AT&T, for instance, collaborates in various international security uh, organizations, such as the uh, US CERT and FIRST, UK Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure, the Australian National Information Exchange, and so forth. We also support security activities within the Internet Engineer Task Force, the Institute of Electrical Engineer, Electronics Engineers, 3GPP, as mentioned, and other organizations. We also participate in a variety of third-party coalitions, such as the Coalition to Reduce Cyber Risk, and we are working with individual countries in their cybersecurity proceedings to promote the NISD framework or ISO as the right standard for an interoperable approach. So cybersecurity standards that exist around the world today are both a powerful bulwark that help industries to protect themselves against the rising tide of cyber threats, helping to raise awareness and ensure accountability and transparency. So I think AT&T, in our way, we support a voluntary risk-based approach to cybersecurity requirements that starts with an overarching framework under which companies have appropriate flexibility to best determine and mitigate their own risks, which will vary from sector size and sophistication of individual companies. Governments should then base national programs on widely adopted international standards to ensure a harmonized approach to cybersecurity. They should not adopt one size fits all approach or mandate a static checklist of cybersecurity requirements. I think I will stop for here now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask a question of Carmen and Helian. I would very much appreciate it if you could prepare some questions and, and we can open a dialogue around this issue of human rights and norms and where we stand in various international processes. So I'm looking to the audience to really engage here. But in the interim, it might be useful just to mention or to cover where you think the two OEWG and the GGE processes are and the different focus areas that they're going to, and how they're going to play out given that they're running in parallel. If you can make a couple of comments each on that, that would be great. And, and the, the role and the opportunity for human rights. Um, well, those two working groups uh, uh, have been established. It's a fact. And, and we are working in parallel in order uh, to support both open-ended working group and the GG. Uh, we have an approach uh, to make sure that those two working groups are complementary. And uh, I think majority um, of um, us in the room uh, would see uh, the favorable outcomes as consensus reports of both working groups. Um, uh, if you ask what is exactly the focus of one of the groups or the other, I think the GG has already uh, um, done a serious groundwork in setting the norms of state behavior or um, confirming that international law applies in cyberspace and promoting the importance of uh, confidence building measures and capacity building. Um, the Open and Working Group could take this basis forward by um, um, including more of the nations uh, into the thinking of what are those elements of the stability framework that has been already set by the three GG reports of 2010, 2013, and 2015. So basically, the Open Ended Working Group uh, has a role to socialize the already existing achievements in the first committee to wider uh, international community. Whereas the GG, uh, in our view, should focus more on the implementation of the current norms and, uh, and the discussions on maybe international law and, and uh, what kind of mechanisms will be there to make sure that uh, the cyber stability is preserved. So, 
uh, the role or the room of maneuver to include human rights uh, is there in both reports. And as this will be about state behavior mostly. So uh, I think um, the stress will be made on international law or concerning human rights and, and the fact that the countries are holding up the different um, pieces of international law that are uh, concerned with human rights. So this is the language we could support, include into those reports. But of course, the first committee of the United Nations is about disarmament, as we know. So it's about, um, in order to, op it's, it's set up for different purposes. But as we have been able to put human rights language always in there, so we hope to continue to do it. I think I can only briefly add, because I think we share your, your, your point of view, we are very like-minded. So what I can add to that is perhaps that um, the open-ended working group hopefully will also uh, lead to more countries around the world uh, um, publicly um, um, embracing the norms that were previously um, set or defined in the groups of governmental experts. Um, uh, that's important because these groups of governmental experts, although they were they varied in in composition and were based um, composed on the principle of rotation and geographic um, uh, representation, have not um, been able to indeed engage all the countries in the world in this discussion. So, the open-ended working group is a chance to to do that, and and hopefully um, this will not only lead to a greater awareness that these norms are out there and that ideally we should all abide by them, but that, I hope also that countries will talk about it publicly more and more, and that will, because that will help to, to um, consolidate um, the, 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 yeah, the power and the in, of, of, of these norms and, and will foster implementation, and that will help us also to uh, call out um, behavior that we uh, consider as uh, going against those norms, as breaking those norms. So that would help. The, the GGE um, uh, has also one particular feature this time that might also help, um, uh, in particular also human rights, um, respecting uh, uh, cybersecurity policies around the world. Um, the, in the mandate of the GGE, it is written that uh, every member of the GGE uh, is supposed to submit its views on how international law applies to cyberspace. Um, and so that means that at least 25 countries will have to sit down and, and, and think carefully about how they see that and, and, and get their, all their agencies uh, at home behind those views and, uh, and, and send them out there in the world. And now that's important because that means that those countries will also have to, at least I hope they will, speak out about the importance of the applicability of the whole corpus of human rights law to cyberspace. So that will help uh, the cause of, of human rights in cyberspace. The Netherlands has sent, a, um, the Netherlands Minister of Foreign Affairs sent a letter to Parliament last June setting out um, the Dutch ideas on how international law applies to cyberspace and how uh, human rights law applies to cyberspace is one of the important chapters of that letter. So I hope that that practice will help. I hope also that others outside the, the UNGGE, by the way, uh, will follow a suit and also issue uh, in, in public, in writing, uh, their views on how international law and including notably international rights, human rights law in cyberspace. Thank you, Carmen. Um, anybody want to open the, uh, really important that we get uh, the questions going. We have a half hour and it'll go quickly. So. Um, um, if you have a question, um, please raise your hand and just introduce yourself and then, and then put the question. If it's going to someone specific, then please mention who that is. Yes. Hi, uh, Chris Painter, among other things, of the Global Commission, former leader of the State Department and the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise. A uh, couple comments and questions. One, uh, I think it's great that we continue to push in the GGE and now in the Open Ended Working Group for language on human rights. I worry, though, and I want your sense of this, is it becomes sort of a dance where uh, the language is in, um, it's a compromise. Uh, I think the more like-minded uh, countries, like the two of you, 
uh, have your interpretation of it, and some of the more repressive countries take different parts of it, uh, you know, more of the restrictions on human rights than the benefits of it. And, and, I, and I guess the question is, with the limits of the first committee, what, where, what venue do you think can make more progress? Is it th something like the Freedom Online Coalition? Is it somewhere else? Uh, the, only, the, the comment I wanted to make is, um, you know, I do think that this does fit in with the, the uh, international security issue. The Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace that I, I've been serving on issued its report two weeks ago at the Paris Peace Forum. And one of the guiding principles that we put in the report uh, is that uh, is respect for human rights. And specifically, I think it has two aspects. One is that efforts to ensure stability of cyberspace must respect human rights. So, in other words, when you do measures to uh, ensure stability, whatever they are, uh, you shouldn't unduly infringe on human rights. You should make sure that you're doing this uh, sensitive to human rights. But the other is that the various protections, the various norms, can protect human rights if those communities even know about them. Uh, you know, when we talk about even the UNGGE norms, the one about protection of, um, of, of certs, and that certs should be used for good, uh, Interestingly, many people in the CERT community don't even know about that from the UN, so I think we have to do some work to make sure that human rights community, even the, the, the community that's meant to be protected, uh, knows about that. And then the last thing I'd say is just, uh, and you mentioned this, I think there's really a need, and when I heard some of the discussions of the open-ended working group, there seems to be somewhat of a consensus on this, for capacity building in this space. Uh, and that's certainly another Dutch initiative, the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, that's one major role they have. But I think the idea of both implementing the norms, making people aware of them, but also doing it in such a way that people understand the human rights dimension is really important in conjunction with things like the Freedom Online Coalition. Thanks, Chris. Who would like to, uh, to take, yep, comment? Uh, Chris, uh, thank you. Yeah, of course, um, you're right. There's always a risk of a ritual dance. Um, in international diplomacy. That's unfortunately part of our trade. But there are always more possibilities to be ingenious and somehow move things in a better direction, at least step by step. And, uh, and um, uh, one thing I do hope is that by forcing uh, countries, whatever their denomination, whether they're autocratic or, um, or, or, or less autocratic and, and more democratic, everybody will have to show um, uh, face or how has, has to, will have to, if, if, if countries can start to write down and, and publish their views on, on indeed on, on application of international law in cyberspace, but also on how uh, a uh, human rights respecting um, uh, cybersecurity policy should look like, and th then they will, um, they're forced to um, to unveil what they are really, what, what their views are, and they perhaps are also forced by the peer pressure to uh, improve and to um, um, perhaps also try to, to in, this is all a beauty contest also, to at least try to be as, as, as human rights abiding as possible, and hopefully that commitment on paper will also help, because that's the other issue of course, uh, will force them a bit more to, to put it into practice. It's all. Well, it's all a matter of uh, uh, a combination of, of, uh, of efforts and, and at the same time efforts by civil society uh, calling out um, bad behavior by states in this regard remains incredibly important. So it's, 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 in the end it's a kind of collective effort and you hope that you can make small but significant steps in advance. That's, that's how it is. I think there are some initiatives uh, related with the open-ended working group uh, on behalf of some NGOs to collect a, um, a good uh, human rights stories uh, on uh, related to uh, freedom online and and um, and, and different um, related topics. And uh, I think that one of the European Union institutes is working, EU ISS, is, is working on on putting together the. Um, compilation of the good uh, cases and models. I think we also need to get a bit more practical uh, to show that there is a way and possibility. I'm not talking, of course, about our countries, but the broader UN membership that uh, where security and freedom can be balanced in cyberspace. Because I think not um, all nations uh, have understood that uh, 
the balance is possible, but it is possible. And, uh, and I think there is also the way to lead uh, the nations to think about this balance. Uh, Chris, I liked, um, I liked your characterization of it as a dance. I mean, one of the challenges, I think, that we, we, we touched on this a little bit before the panel started, was the, the issue of the proliferation of spaces. So um, there are other spaces where these agendas can be, can be um, moved and pushed. Um, but in many times for civil society, I think, as Mallory said, it's, it's certainly a matter of resources and, and, and being able to cover in those different spaces as well. I don't know if you want to add to that, Mallory. Or... Any other questions? Raise your hand. Yes, please. If you can introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Massa. I'm actually a colleague of Mallory's at Article 19. Uh, I focus on uh, digital rights in uh, the Middle Eastern context. Specifically recently, I've been working a lot on Iran, following the events that happened there. Um, I'm particularly interested from the representatives uh, from the government to know how when they engage with the, within these groups they mention at the UN, the GGE, um, how does this work in coordination with uh, other spaces where a lot of governments are actually engaging on issues of rights online, like shutdowns, uh, privacy, uh, especially within the ITU? How, how do you coordinate the engagement between these bodies? Um, I think there are different parts of the government in our uh, countries where, which are in charge of, um, of, of the issues of uh, uh, content and so on. It is more a internal um, services, internal ministries, and not really foreign affairs. And uh, the foreign affairs communities are usually engaging with more the NGOs and the other foreign affairs uh, experts. <laughs> And when we talk about the UN system, then I think we are um, not reaching too far in the UN system into the domestic constituencies, of course. And uh, it is not a clear-cut um, link between the first committee cyber groups and the domestic constituencies. So I think we have to be quite clear that uh, there is uh, the way also to reach the domestic constituencies in different countries. But usually it's not via the UN groups in New York. It is a different way to do it. So let's not maybe, yeah, let's, let's have this conceptual clarity that the UN work goes on in, in New York where countries commit to certain principles, but how these principles will be implemented, it's a matter of each capital. I just wanted to confirm that I think there is more work to be done, states coordinating internally or across different fora, and because I often find that civil society fulfills that role. So because many different organizations coordinate together um, and some of them cover different spaces and so on, there's a bit of, there's, a, there's I think a lot more awareness and knowledge um, within that sector <clears throat> around what states are doing. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, and so often our, part of our advocacy is to remind states um, that they have made commitments in one space um, and that those can translate into this current space and so on. So we often make those connections. It's, it's not necessarily um, something that has to be fully solved or could fully be solved, but maybe also an argument for why um, civil society really does have a lot to offer and a lot of expertise that can be useful in these debates um, because we try to cover so much ground in our advocacy work already. Other questions? We have a roving mic if anybody wants to put up their hand in the, in the back. Yep. Yes, please. Hi, Medica Keo, member of the ICANN board. Um, I had a question because I, as I was listening from the panelists to at and I was thinking, wow, that's really a lot of resources in terms of participating in all the different initiatives to really get the multi-stakeholder view. So how do you actually incorporate inclusiveness in less developed nations who have economic challenges in participating in these initiatives? And what are some capacity building initiatives to, to help with that situation? Yeah. Uh, what we, 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 
we work on those uh, associations and organizations in order to help foster the, um, the broader understanding about cybersecurity. What is important for us is that we have um, the most comprehensive uh, cybersecurity standards and norms in order to operate. That's, that's our understanding. Thank you. If, you may, if I may just add something, because you also raised the issue of capacity building and how do we reach, reach countries that are less developed and less capable and um, in, in cyberspace and also perhaps less aware of the importance of, for example, uh, human rights-based uh, uh, cybersecurity policy. Uh, I, think it is in, I think we need to step up states, but also other stakeholders. Uh, in reaching out. And there are many relevant initiatives going on, uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives to build capacity around the world, um, but there's still a lot of scope for improvement, uh, for more coordination, for um, um, uh, deconflicting and ensuring that resources go to the right places. Um, in October, um, the um, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise met for its fourth um, annual meeting in, in Addis Ababa in, in, in Africa. And um, that was the first time we, the, the Global Forum, a public private uh, platform with um, more than 100 uh, members and partners from the states, um, uh, international organizations, private sector society from around the world went to Africa and reached out really physically and was there and we had more than uh, 40 African uh, countries uh, there present around the table and, um, and it was revealing in the sense that it was obvious that there was a there, there's a lot going on already in Africa. I'm not saying that there's nothing going on there, and there are many good initiatives taken, but there still is a huge need for more interaction and more capacity building. And, and that there's a responsibility not only for governments, I think also for, for private sector from the standpoint of or corporate social responsibility, um, and, and also an additional effort necessary from civil society to go there. Because if we don't do that, if we do not bring the discussion about responsible cyber security policies, etc., to those countries, um, they will not be feel feel um, they're not they won't be aware of the added value, and they won't feel uh, capable and and support it to in their endeavor to uh, develop multi-stakeholder-based responsible cyber security policy. So, in that regard, indeed, I think it's uh, I would like to comment the work of the working group on, on norms uh, and on, on strategy and policy, uh, focusing very much also on the implementation of norms led by Chris in the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. They met here yesterday as well. There, that's also uh, one of those venues where um, not only states, but also other stakeholders sit together to help all members of the GFCE and non-members to, uh, yeah, to empower them to implement those norms that we are, in fact, adopting in the UN. Thanks, Carmen. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Hans Klein. <clears throat> I'm from Georgia Tech. Uh, I haven't really kept up on these issues, but perhaps I'm not the only one in the room who's not completely up to date. But what I remember, the GGE, the big issue that always stood out in my mind was the question on a proportionate response to cyber attack and at what point does a cyber operation justify a kinetic operation. And I believe, as I recall, that was a contentious issue in the GGE. I hope I got this right. And uh, could you perhaps comment on that or, or relate that to the discussion that we're having here today? Thank you. Well, uh, the GG uh, actually has been uh, discussing the um, uh, four different uh, topics. One is the applicability of international law in cyberspace, both uh, peacetime law and wartime law, meaning IHL, UN Charter, and uh, when nations go to war, jus ad bellum as well. So this is one um, element of discussions. The second element of discussions is the voluntary peacetime non-binding norms that governments are uh, adhering to. Uh, the 2013 report listed few, few of those norms and 2015 report listed 11 of those norms. It's all uh, openly available uh, in online on 
uh, UN website. Uh, the third element is the uh, confidence building measures, the regional confidence building measures with all the safeguards, the contact points, for instance. The countries are establishing the contact points. If there is a crisis, they will um, issue the warning and all these contact points will be uh, activated. And then there is a capacity building element for uh, countries that have less capacity to implement the norms uh, that they have um, agreed in the UN. So those are the four different elements and four different work streams. When it comes to response to cyber attacks, then the existing international law is very uh, clearly stipulating what is allowed and what is not allowed for the governments to do in this space. That's why we have the law, body of law. The um, UN Charter uh, uh, is, of course, applying in cyberspace, and this, is, uh, this has been the debate in the GG, and also the debate has been that IHL, International Humanitarian Law, applies uh, in, in cyberspace. Uh, and the customary law also applies in cyberspace. Uh, the international law discussions are difficult because not all countries that are part of the GG are agreeing on how the law applies. So it's not about the response so much, it's about international law applying. And uh, Carmen has been actually part of the last GG. Maybe you can explain what exactly happened and why we did not produce a report. Yeah, I don't know whether to what extent I'm allowed to really, um, but I can say, I can, can um, um, say some few, few, I make a few comments. I think what happened in the last GGE is A, that the geopolitical context was not very favorable. It hasn't even, it hasn't really become much favorable since, by the way. That's a bit daunting with, uh, with in mind that we are going to sit together around the table again. But I think it, 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 that in 16, 17, it, it was um, much more than in the, during the, the GGE in 15 that already took place after some uh, momentous events that changed the situation. In, in, in 16, 17, it was more and more obvious that it, it was just, the context was, was not, not very, very um, inviting or not very helpful uh, in that regard. Um, and what happened was that, unfortunately, some of the, the issues that we had already um, reached agreement about in the area of international law, notably, in, indeed, in, in the report in 15, for example, on the applicability of the principles that um, uh, cement uh, and that support international humanitarian law, uh, principles like uh, proportionality, humanity, distinction, um, these were suddenly uh, contested again to such an extent that, uh, that we threatened to go backwards, that we, were threat we, weren't, we weren't even, there was a threat that we weren't even able to consolidate what we had, but that we were, we were really pushed back. That was very daunting. Also on other elements, for example, all on other elements of the charter, of the, um, the UN charter, uh, for example, the right uh, of self-defense was uh, in cyberspace was suddenly uh, questioned um, by some participants to such an extent that even there it was difficult to hold the line. So that was um, um, the yeah, reason why it wasn't possible in the end to, 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 to uh, reach this, agreement, this, this consensus report. And it was a pity because on, uh, in other areas of work um, of the GGE, like uh, voluntary non-binding norms of behavior, uh, confidence building measures and capacity building, and also the, 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 the section on the dif with the definition of threats. Some good work has been done during that GGE, and we were really, um, uh, we, we, we could have made really progress there. For example, in the norm sections, we have um, elaborated, we elaborated more on how these norms, these 11 norms, foundational norms that were defined in 15, like uh, do not attack each other's um, uh, critical infrastructure in peacetime, uh, do not attack, Chris already referred to it, um, do not attack uh, uh, com uh, computer emerging res uh, emergency response teams in peacetime, uh, work together, uh, assist each other when there are um, cross-border uh, cyber incidents, etc. 
so we were we were we did a lot of work that in 16, 17 to to give more guidance, to provide more guidance to countries on how to do that. Um, when we, for example, discussing critical infrastructure, we also discussed about the um, importance to um, ensure to safeguard the general availability of the internet, uh, alluding to protecting the core of the internet, the logical layer, etc. So a lot of good work was, has been done, but yeah, it, the. the Circumstances were not very propitious then. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Carmen should remember that I was there in the 16 and 17 GGE as member of the Cuban delegation. And what she said is factually correct. There were some issues and there was no agreement. But it, I want to explain what are the concerns of several delegations, because it's not that there is a, a, it was not agreement because of whim or going backwards. Regarding the international humanitarian law, uh, the concerns were that if you uh, accept all those principles a, a priori, in, in a way, you are legitimizing that the cyber war concept, as a concept, cyber war. That was explained in the, uh, the final declaration of several delegations, including, including ours. And that is why the Red Cross made a clarification for this new open-ended working group recently that in a way explain and, and confirms this thing, that, that they put explicitly that by in, in upholding this international humanitarian law does not mean the legitimizing the concept of civil war. It's, the, it's that once that those hostilities are going on, it applies. That was what we were defending at that time. It was unfortunately, you know what happened in that GGE that we left all this, the, the chairman left for the end, all these thorny things and we didn't have time. If we had a couple of more sessions, we could have gotten these results, but unfortunately it wasn't worth. And about the question that was made, it, it's really very concerning. The concept, it needs to be more clarified because when it says that international law and the charter applies in it entirety, a, a, a concept that we did not agree from previous GGE, because it says that it's almost just like that, and it's not just like that, it needs some clarification, because the concept of armed attack that is in the Charter, does, does appear to cyber attack, is cyber attack equivalent to the concept of our attack, that it can trigger countermeasures, and even countermeasures in the kinetic world? That is very dangerous. It's very dangerous because, as you know, the problem of attribution is not solved. And even in kinetic world, where attribution is more directly, you have false, fall, false flag, events in, in the cyber world, we, we have seen that many computers of a country are taken from other country and for there to launch an attack. And if that attribution is not really, it could be some retaliation to, to this country. And, and that is very dangerous for international security. What we are saying in several countries is that although all those principles applied in principle, there should be specific clarifications of how to implement that in practice. Those are not in unsurmountable um, uh, concerns. Many countries, even Western developed countries, has concerns al along the same lines. Some have proposed even some international organization for attribution, something like that. It's things that need some work. It's not that some countries didn't want to, to agree and think that were already agreed. Those are legitimate concerns. It's going to be uh, met in this open-ended working group, and we hope that we can uh, get, because everybody sh should uh, gain by having some understanding on some basic understanding. And if, it's, and if there's a thing that there's no understanding, you, we just keep it in hold until we get the understanding. I think that's the basis of diplomacy, you know, going step by step. Thank you. I realize that we have very little time left, but I want to give the opportunity to Carmen just to comment, and then I think we're going to have to wrap it up. To, oh, and Helly, okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And, and just to, to, to briefly uh, uh, clarify or clarify or uh, comment on that, um, as far as uh, the applicability of international human, humanitarian law is concerned, 
Um, indeed, the, uh, the ICRC in a report issued this year uh, uh, underscored that uh, the fact that also the ICRC clearly and, 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 and explicitly um, uh, um, at, um, underscores the importance of the applicability of international humanitarian law to cyberspace uh, does not mean that that is uh, um, um, that that mean that does not mean that this is um, a, 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 how we say that a carte blanche for uh, uh, for military um, conflict in cyberspace, but nor do the countries that uh, um, um, have um, uh, advocated the applicability of international humanitarian law. Uh, in cyberspace during the previous GGE. I think uh, there we can find each other. We're not advocating conflict. We're just being realistic. There is, just like airplanes were, were, were designed uh, for civil use, they were very quickly used in, 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 in war. So just like that, cyber means will be used or are used in conflict. And then the civil, pop civil uh, population has to be protected. And as far as the the applicability of the um, uh, UN Charter in its entirety is concerned. May I just kindly refer to the fact that the UNGA, the UN uh, General Assembly, has embraced the report of 15 and 13, and has, in, um, uh, about the, the, the 15 report, has explicitly um, um, concluded that member states of the UN should seek guidance from those principles, uh, from those recommendations. And one of those recommendations was indeed that the, uh, the UN Charter, as it stands in its entirety, is applicable in cyberspace. Thanks. OK, last word to uh, Heli, and then I'm afraid we're <laughs> going to have to wrap it up so uh, they can prepare for the next session. I actually wanted, I, I wanted to um, uh, respond to the comment. Um, I wanted to say that attribution is possible. Uh, well, if attribution wasn't possible, we couldn't do anything with cybercrime, but we can do, uh, we can uh, investigate uh, all sorts of incidents, we can investigate cybercrime um, uh, incidents, and as we have increasing capabilities technically to do that in all of our countries, so uh, we already have been attributing uh, in a coordinated manner during the last year several important cyber attacks and uh, we are now reaching the um, stage where um, the attribution is not a problem anymore. The question is rather that uh, how we do it, when we do it, and, and, uh, and whether it will help uh, to solve the issues or whether it will help to, to escalate. But this is already the political question. But the technical attribution is possible. This is what I wanted to say. So, so, so um, I wanted to take us back to, just to leave you with a thought. I think it's always good to walk away from these sessions at the IGF with a thought. I wanted to take you back to some of the, to the comments that were made in the very beginning, which was, how do we ensure that human rights are incorporated into these processes, and how do we ensure that we continue to promote them in these processes, recognizing all the various challenges? And I think that was the call, that was a call to action um, from uh, the panelists in the, in, in the first round of comments, and I think that's something we should very much take forward with us to how in our various stakeholders, across stakeholders, we can continue to ensure that human rights and cybersecurity are considered hand in hand. Um, with that, um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. And uh, just a, a round of applause for our panelists. And thank you very much for your comments and questions. <laughs>